Hello, and welcome to Ignite 2021's On Demand Industry Panel. My name is Stacey Moore, and I'm the Director of Career Services at DelVal. This panel, focused on the equine industry, is part of the Career Services Office Career Exploration Series. You can check out more of our industry panels on the Career Services SharePoint site. So we're very excited today to have each of our industry panelists with us to share more about their career story. Please note that all of the professionals are willing to connect with you, our students. And if you'd like to connect individually with any one of them, you can reach out to cspd at delval.edu and we'll be happy to get you their information. So to get started, we're going to have each of our panelists share their name, their title, and their organization. And we'll kick it off with Brittany. Hi, uh, my name is Brittany Young. I work at Mid-Atlantic Equine Medical Center and I'm a veterinary technician here. Hi, my name is Christina Cox and I am the program director at Equilibrium in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. We are a certified um, or a path accredited therapeutic um, horsemanship center. My name is Maria. I work for a company called Verdi Carb. We make all natural digestive products for horses, livestock, and pets. I forgot to say what I did. I'm um, a territory sales manager. Wonderful. Thank you. So the first question that we have is, what are some of the typical challenges that you deal with in your profession day to day? Um, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, some of the challenges are uh, having to learn new skills every day. Um, in the veterinary field, you, there's so much to learn. You're, you're not ever going to know everything. I've only been here for two years, so I'm still learning. Um, I think another challenge is dealing with the general public, especially during COVID. Um, it's been a challenge communicating with them when they're not actually allowed to be in the building. Um, yeah. Some of the challenges we face at Equilibrium um, right now specifically is a shortage in volunteers. Um, so as the program director, I oversee our volunteer coordinator and we are trying desperately our program can't run without volunteers so we have horse leaders side helpers um just volunteers carry our organization and so right now now that um i think now that covid you know has i don't want to say lightened up but since things are have opened back up we have man, many of our volunteers they're they've either gone back to work or their children are involved in sports. So right now our biggest challenge is uh, how we can safely promote and uh, facilitate our programming, which includes therapeutic riding lessons, carriage driving, groundwork lessons, all of those things um, to keep the participants safe uh, by having enough hands on deck from our volunteers. I would say my personal struggle within my profession has just been time management. So I work from home, I'm in charge of my own schedule, and I have certain um, quotas and goals that I have to have throughout the month. So figuring out how to get those done um, without a structured schedule is my preference, but it also can be a struggle just when there's a lot going on. I think as an industry um, and something specifically our company has had to shift and pivot in is like Brittany and Christina said, the pandemic has changed everything. So I was hired with this company in May of 2019 as an equine specific specialist. And I was supposed to go to horse shows and tax stores and talk to them about the supplement. But when I signed my contract in February, there was no pandemic. When I started in May, we were amidst a lockdown. So having to pivot and use creativity to figure out different ways to reach our customers, um, to maybe jump into different sectors like um, 
our poultry formula or our commercial products instead of the horse. I think just being flexible has been an, an obstacle and an asset in this season. Great, thank you for that. Now, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind just sharing how you got started just in the industry in general and then even into where you're at right now. Um, so I actually started at Mid-Atlantic as a volunteer. They have a full sitting uh, volunteer program during our busy foaling season. So um, they need volunteers to come in and sit with the foals and take physicals and help um, the interns and the technicians with um, their daily care. Um, so I actually started doing that when I was an undergrad to get uh, vet hours. Um, and then coming out of graduation, I really needed to figure out if I wanted to pursue veterinary medicine and go to vet school because it's a huge time commitment, financial commitment. I'm actually a little bit older. I'm in my late twenties. So, you know, I'm not like fresh young twenties. Um, so then I applied and got a full-time technician position. And I think it's been really helpful to help me decide that, you know, veterinary medicine is something I really enjoy. Now I get to see the ups and downs of the industry. Um, and it's something I can really now fully commit myself to. Um, and the volunteer program is actually open to, you know, uh, anybody. Um, so yeah. I'm actually much older and uh, my path started a very long time ago when I was um, an adolescent and I was, you know, I started horseback riding uh, when it got time to choose a career for college, uh, I had horse brain. So all I wanted to do was um, go to school for equine science. And, um, you know, back in the 90s, it, there weren't established programs like many of the universities have today. To be honest, uh, I did a college visit to DelVal. I wanted to go to DelVal, um, but my parents had better ideas. They said, we're not going to send you to college to, I said, I wanted to run a barn and teach riding lessons. And she said, we're not gonna send you to college to do that. Um, I had a very big interest in athletic training and sports medicine. So my path took me down the road where I went to East Strasbourg University. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in athletic training. And for 20 years, I was the head athletic trainer at Nazareth High School. Um, with Coordinated Health, um, now part of Lehigh Valley Health Network. Amidst that time, I decided to get back into horses um, and started volunteering with Equilibrium, um, which led me down the road to wanna to become a, a PATH certified instructor. So as I was doing this, I continued to um, be an athletic trainer full-time, uh, and then teach on the side. Um, unfortunately, during the uh, pandemic, during uh, 2020, unrelated to the pandemic, we lost our contract at Nazareth, and I was left without, um, without my position. Um, I had worked for 20 years doing something that I absolutely loved. I felt it was my passion and I didn't have another school to go into where I could be an athletic trainer. So I continued to work for coordinated health and other capacities and I was just not happy. Um, at that point, the possibility of taking over as program director at Equilibrium came about and I thought that this was my time when one door closed, another open. And I considered making a career shift at 43 years old. Um, and that's what I did. I, in January, I took over as program director and found my passion again. So you're never too old to find where you're supposed to go. Um, the road will lead you there. That's how I ended up um, as part of 
therapeutic horsemanship and, and now the program director. I still use my athletic training background and education experience, all of that to implement um, certain treatment strategies into um, our riders' lesson plans. So that's, that's my long story. That's an awesome story, Christina. Um, so for me, mine, I would say, like Brittany started at undergrad at Del Val, I was an ag business major. I also had horse brain like Christina and wanted to go to school to train horses. And my parents um, kindly encouraged me to maybe do some, some different things, maybe um, something that would help in a business perspective. And if I still wanted to ride horses after college, I could go work for somebody or instead of going to college, I could go um, apprentice somebody, which where I was riding at before I got to um, Dal Dal, that was kind of standard. If you wanted to be an assistant trainer, um, you could apprentice a different trainer. Um, and so as I'm going through my freshman year, I'm wondering, do I switch to equine business? Do I switch to equine science? Actually, I think equine science or studies was only one track when I was there. And I think now it's it's two tracks. Is that right? There's like a business path and a, and a riding path or something. Yeah, there's actually several different avenues that, that students can take. Yeah. So I would say I was the girl that was at the base of that fork or however many um, different options there were. I didn't really know. I knew I wanted to do something with horses and I would imagine that a lot of you were in my same position of, you know, do you follow your passion and maybe have longer, grittier hours? Um, or do you do something that allows you to enjoy the horse without waking up and cleaning up after it all the time or you know like there there are pros and cons and I really felt that struggle of which which way works best for me and so I was a riding instructor while I was at Del Val. I loved it um a lot and as I was approaching uh graduation I started to think about things like health insurance and benefits and 401ks and what would that look like um for me to ride full time how would I be taken care of in those ways? And um, then I actually, I broke my foot. Um, and so I worked at a winery for a little bit. Um, and then one of the boarders at our barn was working for Comcast Business and convinced me to um, interview there. And I can say without a doubt that that was not something I had considered inside sales, on the phone, in a call center um, during my time. But what I loved was that they had a really extensive sales program. And what I was finding was that, um, you know, you get out of college and suddenly they want an entry level um, employee with five years of experience and a college degree, but they want you at this age. And it's like, how do I, how do I get that all? Um, and so for me, this was a, a safe way for me to get the training I needed, and it was a stepping stone. Um, after that, I worked for um, a horseback riding helmet company, and um, it also owned a company that makes apparel for horses, dogs, and people. So horse blankets, saddle pads, um, and I was a customer service and sales rep there, um, and then moved to sales and marketing director. And that job was not at all linear. And I can say without a doubt, I think the other um, lovely ladies on this call would agree that it never is linear, um, but it got me to where I am today now in the supplement industry. I learned so much from that, that I needed to be able to um, manage a sales team and manage products and go into stores and have those connections. Um, I did a lot of traveling in my last job um, which was fun for where I was at in life, but now, um, it wouldn't have worked. And so I'm traveling locally and it's still great. Um, but that's kind of a little bit about what got me to where I'm at today. I would say it's been a really twisty road, but, um, I think my time at Delval and in agribusiness specifically prepared me the most for the career I'm in today than my other fields. Um, just because I'm, I'm working a lot with a lot of different, um, sectors of business from farmers and producers to tax stores. And I think, 
like there are a lot of things that come up that I feel like my class has really prepared me for that I haven't accessed that knowledge for several years now. Um, so it's fun to be able to reach back in those files and say, oh, I remember learning about this. Here's how um, it helped and to feel like those classes are truly helping to serve me and where I'm at right now. Excellent. So how would you say that your career has differed the most or stayed the same from what you imagined it would be? Um, I think that my career goals have stayed the same, but um, in high school, I didn't imagine that my path would be so zigzaggy and like Maria said, not linear. Um, I kind of thought that I would go into undergrad, get it done, apply to vet school, get it done. And I mean, realistically, I imagine myself already being a DVM at this point, but you know, life happens. Um, it, it's okay not to have that straight path. Um, you know, actually, I'm appreciative of the path that I've taken now that I look back. Um, yeah, it would be nice to be in my settled career at this point. But, you know, I've learned a lot in life. I've worked a lot of different jobs. Um, I got to go to Del Valle. You know, I went to Temple University initially, right out of high school. And I realized, like, it was a lot to jump from high school straight into undergrad. And, you know, I don't really think the high school actually prepares you that well for college. Um, especially if you are a good student, sometimes high school is like a little easy and then you go to college and you're like, wow, I actually have to like sit down and study and time management. And you know, you don't really learn that in high school. So um, yeah, uh, I've learned so much, you know, um, Del Vale really helped me. I could network a lot. I found the full sitting position through Del Vale's E360 experience page and um, I got a job here and I've learned so much. I've had so many opportunities to work with so many great doctors and actually figure out, you know, this is the path that I want. And I would give students advice to put yourself in those positions that you intend to like have a career in so that you know, you know, you may think it's one thing and then you get in there and you're like, wow, this is actually not something I'm interested in, or this is not what I thought it was. Um, you know, I had shadowed a couple small animal vets and I figured out, you know, it, I like the medicine aspect of it, but I'm not, you know, it's not really my area that I'm comfortable with. I'm more comfortable with horse people. I grew up doing the horses, thought I was gonna be a horse trainer, you know, um, just kind of figuring out where you fit and what kind of people you enjoy being around. I mean, you're not gonna be around the people you always enjoy all the time, obviously, but kind of just figure out where you're, you fit in and where you're comfortable. I think it's great that I feel like all three of us uh, thought when we were in high school that we were gonna grow up to be, our, I think we must have all had really good riding instructors and trainers because I think, I know I idolized mine and I said, that's what I wanna do. I think it's funny that we all kind of thought that was the path we were going to take. Um, for me, uh, when I was 14, I tore my ACL and I did it playing softball when I would have rather been riding my horse at the time. So I kind of really resented what had happened and how it took me away from riding. And then I almost resented, you know, how that was the field that I, you know, was going to go into then. But I really enjoyed it. And to be honest, I, I had kind of gotten away from, from horses while I was in college and in my 20s. And I think when I was about 10 years into athletic training, I maybe like, I think it was eight years into it, I got my master's. I was the oldest person in my master's class. And I thought I have to, this is the time in my life where I have to take it to the next level. I have to go work at a college, I have to look into professional sports. But at this point in my life, I had already been, um, you know, I was in my late 20s or 30 or something and, and deciding, you know, I had animals at my house, I couldn't go traveling the world with with a sports team. So 
I, instead of telling myself that I was, there was something wrong with staying in one position for 10 years, um, I, I decided it wasn't necessarily complacency that I would embrace it. So like I said, I ended up at Nazareth for 20 years. I thought I would have retired there. I did not expect at all for my career to differ from what I had never thought that I would be in the position that I am now, but I'm 100% grateful for it because I truly believe that this is where I'm supposed to be. And from the very beginning, you know, my advice to you as a student is if you're looking into something into the equine field, it might not be the best route to just dive right into it and try to um, either create something or um, find something cookie cutter. Um, find what you love and go from there. I think as, um, I think it might've been Maria that um, mentioned something earlier, you know, you can always, if you go to school for something else first, um, or, or have, you know, something that can back you as you go through your career. For me, I, I wouldn't be able to be the quality program director that I am, or I shouldn't say that, like deliver quality program services at Equilibrium without having the athletic training background that I do. So don't be afraid to take different paths because it'll ultimately land you where you're supposed to be. And I think bouncing off of what Christina said, there's no right or wrong answer. I think when I was a senior, even probably my whole time in Del Mal, I felt like a lot of, I felt a lot of pressure on what career path I took and that it would really set the trajectory of the rest of my life and that it was super important and super crucial that I picked the right one. And I think the right one for you is wherever you're at and making the best with that. And I wish that I could go back and tell myself like, hey, just because you're taking a job at a telecommunications company doesn't mean that your dreams are dead. It's just a, a detour on the way there. And yeah, I think for me, I ultimately hoped to end up in a field similar when I was kind of had figured out that I wanted to go towards the business sector and enjoy horses as a hobby more than as a profession, um, but still be involved with them in some capacity. So I hoped that I would be in some sort of business um, that got me to work with horse people and pet horses during the day. And yesterday I talked to a guy um, who has a team of driving horses that he works his field with in Lancaster. And I got to, to scratch this lovely mare's head while we had a meeting about um, our supplements. So I think that that's ultimately where I wanted to land. The thing that looks different is that I don't have a horse right now. And I really wish that that could be different, but at the same time, it doesn't match the goals that, um, that we have as a family and that's okay too. Yeah, I think from what you just said, uh, Maria, that a really nice next question to follow up, whether you want to kick us off or whoever wants to at this point, that's fine. Can you speak more about a time when your personal life impacted your professional life and how you handled that time at work? Yeah, so for me, I think a couple years post-grad, I was struggling with boundaries, profession like personally and professionally, and what it looked like to stand up for myself in a professional workplace. I think as a recent grad, I was really in a mindset of, I need to do whatever it takes to get the job done. So if it's working more hours, if it's accepting less pay for something, it's not taking time off for holidays, you know, whatever it was, I was trying to do these things to get ahead. And then um, I kind of hit this place where I was like, I'm an asset to this company and like, I'm unhappy because I'm, I wouldn't say selling my soul, but you know, I was leaving for work at 5 a.m., driving an hour and a half. And then I would get home from work at like 5.30 p.m. And 
I was just experiencing a lot of burnout and trying to figure out exactly like what would be next for me if I had to leave that position or like, what would I do? I felt constantly stressed and I got a lot of anxiety. Um, and it turned out that I decided that I would start counseling. And, um, I think counseling is something that everybody should have, um, at some point of life for multiple points of life. Um, and so that really helped me just to set to set boundaries. And while it was really hard, I was able to stay at my current position and just stick up for myself in certain ways of like, hey, I'm like, this isn't working for me. I need to work ho from home on a certain days a week. Or like, I, I need to take time off because I've just been gone the past three months. And like, what is waiting for me at home, you know? So I think for me, it was learning to stick up to myself and figuring out what that balance of like, as an, as a recent grad, how much do I need to prove myself as an employee and how much do I need to uh, be kind to myself and, and stick up for myself for what I need to be a better employee, because you can't, you can't contribute your best if you're not at your best and you're not filling up your buckets or your soul or, you know, feeding those times. So I would say that was a really hard thing for me. And that's something that I still struggle with and still have to check in with people. You know, my husband's really good about encouraging me. And I have a few friends that will um, just kind of check in and, and ask me like how I'm sticking up for myself. So um, I think, especially with so many people having pandemic fatigue, and just everything going on, it's super important just to a find find a group of people that can support you and make sure that you are um, caring for yourself well and um, be doing it. Yeah, I think to go off what Maria said, I I have a really hard time saying no to people and it's something I'm still working on um, in my personal life and in my professional life um, but I'm realizing that you know I'm kind of like I said in that in-between stage where I'm not really at the career goal that I have um, working you know I'm stepping towards that but um, so I, I have this like personal challenge where I'm like I need to you know hustle every day all day but it gets to a point where you can do that for so long and you get home and then you do nothing for yourself. You get home and you've exerted all your energy at your job and then <laughs> you go home and you're like, well, there's all these things that I wanna do for myself, but I just cannot even look at it. Um, so I think it's really important to say no. Um, it's not being rude. You kind of have to be a little selfish and I know it's hard for a lot of people, but saying no isn't being a bad person. You're not a bad employee. You're not a bad friend. You know, you don't have to answer the phone all the time. Um, you don't have to, you know, hang out with everybody all the time. It's okay to say no to people. And I think it's really important. And I'm struggling with that, <laughs> learning how to deal with that. And, you know, setting, it's, you know, setting up boundaries, like Maria said, um, you don't, it, you don't have to work a thousand hours to be a good employee. You don't, you know, I try and take on so many things at work where, you know, you're saying yes to everybody. Like I can help you with this. I can help you with that. Um, and then you realize that you're severely putting on the back burner, your responsibilities and what you're supposed to do. And then you're not giving your all to your position. You're trying to help everybody, but you're not helping yourself. So I think it's important. Mental health is really important. <laughs> I think the take home message here between Brittany and Maria both, um, I can really relate to both of you guys, um, is, is self care. And, you know, I, I too have a hard time with boundaries and um, saying no to people. And I think it's because I, I myself am like you just said, Brittany, like a go-getter. I, I could be at work all day long because I love it and I just want to keep doing it. Um, personally for me, I, um, I, I had learned in the past 
year and a half now that there is a difference between being selfish and and caring for yourself and um and and i decided that i was going to be selfish in a good way and take care of myself um when the pandemic hit uh in march of 2020 uh we were just starting our spring sports season and out of nowhere everything was canceled and the schools shut down so what do you do with athletic trainers when the school shuts down and you have to stay employed you either get furloughed which was not an option for me i have a small farm with four horses and i needed to bring it home an income um that you know I, I couldn't just rely on my husband to support what we have going here um so i was we were redeployed uh into frontline workers i was doing screenings at big warehouses at sometimes five o'clock in the morning uh and midnight um i was extremely burnt out i became depressed i dealt with anxiety i had one panic attack where I've never ha experienced anything like this in my life. And I wondered if I needed to go to the hospital. Um, it was very scary. And all of this was because I felt I was not doing what I had set out to do. I had, I had been control of that my whole life. My, I loved my job because I loved it, because I wanted to do it. And had I not, I wouldn't have done it. So when this happened and that was taken away, um, and I didn't have any other choice but to go and do this awful job. Um, it was really hard on me to not be able to, to do what I want, my passion to follow what I was doing. Um, after that, after, you know, it was just only a few months later that sports started to open back up that we lost our contract and then it was the second blow. Um, and at that point, I was just, I didn't know I was really struggling. I was working, like I said, other jobs, uh, not other jobs, but a different position within coordinated health. And I, I was, I was not happy. I didn't feel like this is where I belonged at this point. So it was a really tough personal decision to make such a career move into being the program director over at Equilibrium because I had to take a major pay cut. I mean, major because it's a nonprofit. I can't go into this nonprofit and say, well, you have to match what I was making at, at a major hospital system. It's not, it's, that's not how it works. And um, I decided that my happiness and my health and my, my ability to be able to help others and bring about change in the world was more important than, um, you know, having a big sat I'm not even a big salary athletic trainers don't even make a lot of money um but you know I I had a Jeep Wrangler I loved it so much and and I was forced to sell it um because I couldn't afford it anymore and those are the little sacrifices that you make so my advice is to follow follow where your passion is follow where your heart is because ultimately what you do and how how you share yourself and your talents and your abilities and your soul with the world is more important than the material things because burnout will happen and it's not worth it. You know, I could have kept my job and driven my nice Jeep to work, but I hated my job. So, you know, I'd rather, you know, drive an old truck down the street to where I love to be. And that's more important to me. So you have to take the time to evaluate those, those personal, um, goals and and the things that your values what what matters to you the most and and go from there and take your self-care as make self-care a priority that was excellent and as we're coming up to the end of our time that advice is so valuable and i have to thank each of you for being so open about your experiences i know that that is something that students really value hearing. So really, we appreciate that very much. And I, I just wanted to give a chance for any final thoughts or pieces of advice. If you have anything to share, just feel free and we will uh, conclude our panel after that. So anything you'd like to share? 
Um, I kind of like to share with students that, um, you know, just because you think you failed um, at something or, you know, you may have made the wrong choices at a certain point in time, it's not the end of the world. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Um, I will probably continue to make a lot of mistakes in my life, but that doesn't mean that you're not good enough. Um, it doesn't mean you're not smart enough to do whatever you want to do. And to keep trying, you know, if I don't get into vet school this year, I'll probably try again. You know, it's not that big of a deal. Um, there's still time. There's always time. You know, my mom went back to school when she was in her fifties. I'm sure there's a ton of people that go back to school. It's not the end of the world and you can still do whatever you want to do. Um, even if you've made mistakes. My advice to students is to um, take pride in how you represent yourself. Um, that is huge. And coming from a position now where we just had to hire a director of equine operations, I took a look at a couple resumes. And because one of the resumes, uh, the person had a lot of experience, many, many years of experience, but represented herself very poorly on paper it was a, it was not even it was a no-brainer that person couldn't be considered because of documentation is a big part of what that role uh needs how how they you know wrote on paper didn't didn't really align with with our vision um so take pride in how you represent yourself um know that your resumes are looked at and how you text people. Um, yeah, this is my soapbox spiel about like using punctuation and, and really represent yourself well because it really does matter uh, when somebody is looking to hire or looking to add you as a member of their team, you know, member of the team. So take pride in yourself. And first of all, know that you're, you're important enough and, and you deserve what you're going after and then and then represent yourself as if you truly believe that in yourself oh my goodness yes so i was gonna say uh, something very similar um i'm gonna give a little tough love here look over your resumes then look over them again and something that was super helpful to me that i wish the people that i've interviewed from delval took advantage of was go to the cpsg go through their mock interviews have them help you with your resume the and like don't be afraid to reach out to people if you're interested in a career i think that right now everyone is hiring and if they're not like they might know somebody so i feel like i've been in in my last position and in this position um a big part of my role was hiring recruiting and the amount of talent that we have to overlook because there's typos or because the cover letter still says dear and then name and they didn't type in you know like silly little mistakes that if you just write it out loud or had another set of eyes or maybe did a little research about the company you're interviewing with um it, it could make you such a valuable candidate. And we really do want to hire um, recent grads like our industry does, and especially DelVal people or other people with horse experience. Um, in the equine business industry, you really need people with actual horse experience. So no joke, uh, we hired somebody in marketing that didn't and they, um, they put uh, something that goes on the horse's neck uh, as a, um, on our website under like, hawk cover, like a like an item that was totally unrelatable. So you really do need people with horse experience. We'd love to have you just show up well, prepare well. Great advice. I appreciate all of it and everything that all of you have said. So on behalf of the Career Services Office, thank you so much for your time. And uh, like I said, students, if you'd like to get in touch with any of our panelists today, please feel free to reach out to us at cspd at delval.edu and we'll get you set up.